Okay, so as you see, the title of this, this keynote talk has a question, and the question relates to the paranoia the when it comes to security. I think most of you would agree that when it comes to security, unlike power and performance, a little bit of paranoia is a good thing. Not only you have to be cautious, you have to be a bit paranoid, but the question is that, are you paranoid enough? And I hope that at the end of the talk, you'll be able to find an answer to that question. Again, the topic is Internet of Things security, and as you can easily guess, that's that's pretty broad topic. And what I will do, I will give you a glimpse of the challenges we have in IoT security, including the emerging ones, and then I'll talk about some protection mechanisms which are on the horizon. So we are at an interesting juncture when it comes to digital transformation of the whole world, and this particular evolution is because of the fact that we are looking into diverse application space. Today, these Internet of Things devices, which are smart and intelligent and connected computing and sensing devices, these are pretty much in everyone's hand, starting from my five-year-old daughter to my 95-year-old grandmom. And of course, this is not my daughter or my grandmom, but I hope I can take a picture of with, with them, with the computing devices. But these devices are in everybody's hand, literally, from smart wearables to smart home devices, they are used everywhere. And this explosion of application space is the one that's driving unprecedented scale of IoT devices or endpoint IoT devices being used in diverse sectors. This is one of the data point which shows that by 2020, we are expecting 25 billion connected devices. Just to give you a reference, it took about 20 years, a little bit more than 20 years, for everyone on the face of the earth to have a cell phone, in terms, on an average. So we have about 6.8 billion uh, cell phones on the face of the earth, and that took a 20 years, and we're hoping that in another three to four years, we'll basically have up to four devices per person. So that's a 4x growth in just four years. Now, of course, this kind of growth has never been seen by any industry ever in the history of mankind. To go with that, the IoT revenue is expected to grow exponentially for the next few years by IDC, that's, that's the research organization that basically analyzes the growth rate. The expected IoT revenue growth is going to be $1.7 trillion globally by 2020. And again, this is another dimension of Moore's law. We are, we are seeing exponential growth in the revenue or the, or, or the money associated, associated with the IoT solutions. When it comes to security, there's an interesting question here. So we have huge devices, huge number of devices, and they're used in diverse sectors, and they're potentially used by naive people, like my grandmom or like my daughter. So the question is that, how do you protect these diverse, highly complex computing systems in the hands of potentially naive users, particularly when the threats are very, very diverse, and it comes from all angles? I'll talk about that. But what makes it even worse is that we're living in a highly connected world. All of these IoT endpoint devices are connected among themselves, and these devices are talking to the gateway, and the gateway is talking to the cloud. And cloud itself is a set of connected servers, often physically distributed in different regions. So if you have so many connected devices, then now all of a sudden, vulnerability in one device can be the weakest link for the entire IoT system. And in this CES, we have seen really crazy connected devices, a toilet which you can speak to, right? And we have huggable robots which are also connected to other, other devices in the home. So this, these crazy connected devices create interesting security challenges and that's accentuated by the fact that these devices are being used by naive users. So the security question is even more complex now and that stands like this, I'm not going to read that, but if you are a security engineer or a security researcher like me, then you have to address this bigger question when it comes to security of IoT. Now, one typical question 
People ask me all the time when I give a talk on IoT security is that what's new in IoT security? Is it different from traditional computer security or traditional embedded system security? The answer is yes. IoT security requires a significant rethinking. Now, why? The number one reason is that most of these IoT devices, talking about let's say smart home devices or even the smart car, autonomous car which is connected and also which can do a lot of decisions itself. These devices interact with the physical world on a regular basis. Think about the smart toaster, think about the smart light bulb or smart thermostat. Because they interact with the physical world, any security attack on those devices can potentially lead to physical harm, even death. Again, talking about devices which can actually interact with human being on a daily basis. Now, this is different from the traditional cybersecurity breaches. For example, if you have a data breach, uh, the ones in Target, ones in Equifax, ones in Sony, they do not typically physically lead to a human harm. But here, the IoT security involves an interesting payload that comes to, comes to physical harm for human beings. Many of these devices have a long, complex life cycle. Think about the refrigerator, smart refrigerator in your home, or the smart car. These devices would typically live for 20 to 30 years. And this is very really unlike your, your cell phone, which you might want to change every two years, right? Now, the moment they have long, complex life, the security requirements can evolve over time and new attacks can surface. So, which means you need to come up with device architecture and a framework which can adapt itself to deal with the emerging security requirements over the lifetime of the device. Many of these devices are must produced like the smart light bulb, for example, smart must produced in the same hardware software configuration. Now the problem with having identical configuration, even though they are being used in diverse application sectors, for a specific application, the device is exactly same and which means the device which is used by you and used by me, they have exact same configuration. For an attacker, this is an interesting aspect, an advantageous aspect, because if I can spend some time to understand the vulnerability for one device, I can actually hack into your device. And I'll give you an example shortly, but that's a big problem. The homogeneity in terms of hardware and software configuration can be helping the attacker in big way. And this, some of these devices are never intended to be connected. For example, the smart light bulb, it doesn't have the hardware software infrastructure to implement the complex communication protocols that can secure the communication between this device and another device that can secure the data locally stored in that device. So that's the problem in terms of many devices which are never intended in the first place to be connected to the internet. Many of these communications are machine to machine, particularly at the endpoint device level, the communications are machine to machine and no human in the loop. The moment there is no human in the loop, the authentication becomes problem and it also means that if you have one compromised device, then it can potentially compromise the other device. For example, if my smart refrigerator is talking to my smart car and probably asking it to bring some grocery from the market on the way back to home, then a potential hack in the refrigerator can also misguide or misdirect the autonomous car which it's talking to, right? The another important aspect is the physical attacks. Many of these IoT devices, particularly let's say the one used in industrial plants or used in military systems, used in harsh environments, they are very much prone to physical attacks. A few years ago, a uh, US drone, as you know, was captured by a, uh, by a country in hostile territory. And what they did, once they captured the device, they can do a lot of interesting and powerful physical attacks on the device. For this specific drone, they actually could reverse engineer the hardware and software, get access to the information, secret information, design information that's inside that drone. And not only that, they could actually get the secret data, or sensitive data stored there. So physical attacks is an interesting attack modality when it comes to IoT applications. And finally, because the IoT is, is basically a system, it's a basically a layer of endpoint devices connected among themselves, talking to the gateways, talking to the cloud, you have to think about the security of all the layers at the same time to come up with a holistic comprehensive solution for IoT. Just securing one device is not enough because it can be affected by another one which is not secure or trustworthy. So when it comes to IoT security, 
there is an important requirement of rethinking the security of traditional security of computer systems. So I'll give you some examples of attacks on IoT. And some of them uh, happen in real life and some of them happen in lab. The first one is called Dean Cyber Attack. I think many of you have heard about that. October 21st, 2016, many of the internet platforms and services in North America and Europe went down. And they went down because of a very unique attack. And this particular attack involved millions of internet connected devices. And these devices are not your computer, no, not your laptop or desktop. These devices were simple devices, IoT devices like baby monitors, IP cameras, security gateways in your home, and, and some other devices like that. And these devices were infected by a um, malware, specific malware called Mirai malware. And this particular malware was capable of issuing IP translation requests to a DNS server managed by a company called Dean. And because there are millions of them, this army of millions of affected IoT devices were making malicious DNS requests, they could actually um, disable the DNS server for a long time, as you know, many of these internet services were not available. So this basically shows the potential attack modalities that can happen by exploiting the IoT devices, and that's, that's a very different attack, probably the first time in the history of mankind that happened where the, uh, a botnet was introduced on the IoT devices, endpoint IoT devices, and that was the cause for creating a larger scale attack in a, in, in, in a in, in, in a large regions of United States and, and Europe. And then in the lab, we will basically show you shortly that we could actually affect many of these smart connected devices to do a lot of interesting things. Now what, what is done typically for Dean attack is that an attacker would be looking for vulnerability in the IoT devices. The first thing is that if I'm the attacker, I try to see what vulnerability we have in the IoT devices. A, a very simple one is that we are using, let's say, smart home devices like thermostat or like IP camera. And we forget or we become lazy enough not to change the default login and password. Now, this default login and password set by the company is known to the attacker. And for the Dean Cyber Attack, what the attacker did is that they inserted malware by exploiting this default login and password, they could actually access the device and then install the malware and this particular malware can then do whatever the attacker wants, wanted to do. So the attacks are done in three steps. The first step is that the attacker would try to understand the vulnerability in the system and then with respect to the vulnerability, by, by exploiting the vulnerability, the attacker would install a malware and gain access to the device and finally by after installing the malware, the attacker would do an interesting payload the way the attacker wants. For example, in the case of Dean cyber attack, the attacker wanted to create malicious IP transition request or DNS request to the Dean server. So this is how the attack is done for, for IoT devices. Now this attack is definitely a software slash network attack. There are other attacks which we have done in our research lab. This is in collaboration with Professor E.R. Jean at the University of Florida. What he did, he took a Nest Intelligent Thermostat. And as you know, this is a thermostat, second generation thermostat, which can actually learn your behavior and accordingly control the temperature of the, of the home. And in this particular thermostat, what he did is that, he and, and his students in collaboration with us, what he did is that he looked at the processor and figured out that during the boot process, the processor is actually doing some integrity check of the file system. But it's doing it for a specific boot process. And the processor actually supports multiple different boot processes. So what he did, by using a different boot process, he could actually install a, a very different boot routine. And when he was booting the system, the system was booting with his boot routine. And he could actually use the Nest thermostat to play YouTube video. So as you can see here, this device can be easily hacked even though the security engineers in Nest did put some integrity check during the secure boot process. So the other one is even, even more scary. So what we did is that we looked at different IP cameras in India and China 
and by looking at their IP address what we could do we could remotely install a malware in that typically the Mirai type malware and with that we can have legitimate access to the recorded video as a typical legitimate user would do so basically what we are showing here is that this is one in China and, and remotely we can access the the IP camera by installing a Mirai type malware in that camera and then we can actually look at the recorded video by that camera all without touching the device and all doing doing it from US this is the same one from, for location in India again we are, we are just showing that these IoT devices are extremely vulnerable for even remote attack by exploiting the vulnerability in the software and network so this one is just for a smart meter and this is a very interesting attack modality what we did is that we inserted something we, we implemented something like CBL attack CBL attack is an attack that is done in peer to peer network where one compromised device can spoof the identity for the other device so for this smart meter which is connected to the internet what we did we, we took a similar smart meter and that similar smart meter actually was compromised and then without touching the original smart meter we could transmit the, re the, the reading for the meter with the same identity and that means that if we basically hack one device we can, we can hack the other device and that's very scary because as I said other devices are manufactured with the same configurations in millions and if I'm the attacker and if, if I spend some time to understand the vulnerability for one device I can use that knowledge to hack into other devices and these attacks are all exploiting the vulnerability in the software and network now one thing you have to understand that's not the end of the story the, there are a lot of vulnerabilities in the hardware itself traditionally cyber security experts assume that the hardware can act as the root of trust which means the hardware can be considered secure and trustworthy for all, all practical purposes or for building the software stack on top of it but unfortunately there are a lot of interesting attacks powerful attacks coming on the hardware which violates that fundamental assumption and I'll give you some examples sh shortly but before I do I'll talk to I'll, I'll try to explain what do you mean by hardware when you talk about hardware for a electronic product we are basically talking about three levels of abstraction if you look into your cell phone if you if you can if you break open your cell phone it's not recommended but if you do then what you will see that inside the inside the device you have one or more printed circuit board modules and these printed circuit boards would provide electronic connection electrical connection and mechanical support to the, the to the electrical and electronic components and the most important component inside your device would be the microprocessor or the system on chip or the PC, right and this is true for for any smart device any smart audio device and this is also true for any computing device you can think of so there are three layers of abstraction at the bottom most layer you have these microchips and then you have the printed circuit board and then you have the actual system which is made with this printed circuit board as I said traditionally these these hardware levels are considered all trustworthy and the software would rely on that assumption but not anymore because there are interesting attack modalities that can happen on the hardware now what are those attacks that can happen on hardware who are the attackers and what do they look like again talking about look this is how a typical attacker looks like and uh, this is the life cycle for the hardware it starts from a design spec then it goes to integrated circuit design house like Intel or Qualcomm or Samsung and then inside the design, design house through complex set of trans transformations and design process we obtain something called layout for that integrated circuit in, in typically the form called GDS2 this GDS2 is then sent to the foundry which typically is outside that company most of these companies semiconductor companies these days are fabless companies which means they rely on external foundry to fabricate the chips for example if it is Qualcomm they are fabricating the chip in TSMC if it is Xilinx also they are, they are fabricating in, in an offshore facility in Taiwan so these foundries 
are untrusted foundries, which means if I am the chip designer, I am relying on a third party foundry to fabricate my chips and I do not trust that foundry. After the chips are fabricated, then they do wafer testing, which is basically this 12 inch circular die, which has hundreds of chips. Those chips are actually then cut using a diamond saw, goes through an assembly and packaging process. After the chips are packaged, typically with ceramic packaging, then we do a package testing to understand the functionality is correct, to check the functionality and also to check the parameters. Finally, those chips which pass the testing would go to the printed circuit board design house or say system integration process where they will put the firmware on top of that and then eventually they go to system design or system integrator like like Dell or Apple or other companies, right? So, so the attacks can happen on hardware at different stages in this entire life cycle. Almost all stages except for the design specification stage can be untrusted. The ones which are, which are marked in red, they are typically most untrustworthy. Particularly the fab actually has your entire design. They can do anything they want with that design. They can overproduce. They can reverse engineer. They can, they can clone it. They can actually also inject malware on the hardware. We'll talk about that shortly. So the point is that during the whole life cycle, there can be a lot of different attacks. Now what are those attacks that can happen on the hardware? I'll give you a glimpse on, on some of them. So this is the life cycle for typical system on chip, the ones that go into your tablet, that go into your cell phone, for example, or also a lot of IoT devices. So during this entire life cycle for system on chip, what happens is that the in intellectual property blocks or IP blocks like the processor or memory or the USB communication engine or the crypto engine, they will come from different IP vendors. We call them hardware IP. They will come from different IP vendors, typically distributed globally. Now, the problem is that if I am the chip designer and I am buying IPs from different companies which I do not trust, then I have to basically make sure those IPs are trustworthy. That's an, that's an uh, important problem and actually it's an unsolved problem today. It's very difficult to verify the trustworthiness for these third party IPs which are coming to me from globally distributed sources. And the reason it's so difficult to verify the trustworthy for those IPs is that we do not have any reference. For example, if I'm buying um, a crypto IP from a company in, let's say, India or China or Malaysia, it comes to me in the form of an RTL or design file, a grade level design file, and then I have the spec, functional spec. I do not know what to compare with. And it can have an embedded malware or malicious component inside it which can snoop my valuable data or which can trigger malfunction during the long hours of operation and I have pretty much no way to verify. That's an unsolved problem. A lot of researchers are working on it. So this malware that can go inside the hardware is called hardware trojan. I'll talk about that more. So that can happen at the IP vendor's house and then when it comes to the system on chip design house, that itself is typically distributed across the globe. For example, a company like Cisco can send their, their test insertion um, process, can, can rely on a facility in India or China for the DFT insertion, which is designed for testability insertion, and then for physical designs, some other facility. So the point is that if the design house itself is distributed and involves lot of untrusted or potentially rogue employees, then how do you ensure the trustworthiness for the entire system on chip which is being designed from this design house? On top of that, those IPs which are coming from different companies, they may be pirated by a rogue employee. In the foundry, as I mentioned, there are a lot of interesting security issues that can happen um, to the chip. They have the entire unencrypted design at their hand and if they want to pirate or overproduce or clone or reverse engineer, they can do that. And finally, during deployment, the, the hardware is vulnerable to various attacks. And one of the important ones, it's called side channel attack, where we can actually look at the power profile or electromagnetic signature and, and figure out the secret which is stored inside the chip. That's called side channel attack. We have recently looked into another attack modality where lot of magnetic memories which are being used these days in many of these devices 
they are vulnerable to field attack which means if you are the attacker you can create a field without touching the device by creating an electromagnetic field you can not only change the values you can or destroy the values and create a denial of service attack but also you can actually manipulate the values so how do you deal with these problems as a researcher we are looking at targeted solutions and these solutions can be in the form of design solution where you say that okay during the design process you have to do this to prevent this attack or you can come up with test solutions so that you can say if there is a malware in the hardware i can verify it i can detect it and disregard the chip right so the solutions can be either design solution or test solutions there is another solution modality which is called runtime monitoring if there is an attack and if you cannot detect it during the test process or you cannot prevent it during the design then you can actually detect it at runtime potentially and runtime monitoring is evolving as an important solution potentially last line of defense in safeguarding against hardware problems this slide is taken from SRC CEO Ken Hansen he basically said that if there is a problem in hardware that can be way more dangerous and it can affect way more devices than attacks on software or attacks on attacks on um, uh, at the high level maybe at the, at the social engineering level so there are different levels in which the attack can happen and compared to let's say the virus and trojans that can that can be inserted in the software an attack in the hardware can be three order of magnitude more dangerous because it can basically affect large number of devices that's one of the problems with hardware attacks another interesting problem with hardware attack is that hardware is typically not fixable in field if you have a problem in software i can send you a patch you can install the patch you'll be good to go and we do that on a regular basis right for your cell phone for your tablet and uh, other computing devices you do patching even for the iot devices many of the iot devices these days are trying to equip with patching capability particularly the ones which are running reduced versions of linux or other software operating system software they are being equipped with regular patching capability of the software but when it comes to hardware vulnerability then how do you patch it the hardware is intrinsically not patchable right so can you come up with a hardware framework which can patch itself when the attack surfaces and that's an interesting research problem we actually published an article recently in IEEE Spectrum on November 2017 which talks about hardware patching uh, if you're interested you can read the article I'll talk about the solution we are looking at in that regime in that area so um, so that's an important requirement also now to make things worse there is an increasing number of counterfeit chips and counterfeit PCBs which are coming in the supply chain and this is a serious problem this is growing about 20% annual at a 20% annual rate growth rate as you can look at this particular bar chart this the the growth for counterfeit attack counterfeiting um, attacks or counterfeit chips and PCBs is, is significant electronic companies are, uh, are losing about 100 billion a year due to counterfeit uh, goods okay and there are many different types of counterfeit electronics for example it can be recycled and that's one of the important maybe about 60 to 70 percent of these counterfeit chips are recycled one of the important type of counterfeit chips it can be remarked it can be overproduced by the fab out of spec defective cloned which means I steal the design from you and then I make another copy of that it can be a forged documentation which is like a fake certification uh, a chip which is let's say not working at a high performance level you certify that it's working at the high performance level and finally it can be tampered for example a chip which is cloned at the same time it has a malicious hardware inside it so it's a huge problem and and, and again there is no well accepted solution in the industry to deal with the counterfeiting chips counterfeit chips and counterfeit pcbs so there is a significant rise of clones across the years we wrote an article in IEEE spectrum last year on that topic also which basically talks about the rising incidences of clones the growing concerns with that what it can do to you the clones unfortunately not can be uh, can can not only be uh, a low performance unreliable component it can also come with malicious hardware inside it and that's more dangerous when it when it 
comes to clone these are the three examples of of clones which we we found out there are a lot of cloned hardware in our research lab if you are interested you can visit us and we'll show you actually blot up them or we call them actually equivalent in terms of price equivalent to gold because these are good vehicles for research so the first one is is a fake Canon flash and as you can see they look very similar it's very difficult for you if you are trying to purchase that and some of some some of the times you are purchasing them from eBay or from online and it's extremely difficult for you to figure out if it is a fake one or not the other one is Cisco router that's an interesting example on the right hand side you have the genuine one left hand side you have the counterfeit one you see there is some visual difference but extremely difficult to identify which one is fake just looking at it at bare eye an interesting story goes like that the counterfeit Cisco router actually was better than the genuine router because it fixed some bug in the in the counterfeit version which the Cisco router had and the third one is actually um, is more dangerous because this is a fake component um, the fake one for the Honda S300 component which goes to engine control unit for Honda vehicles and they they released a notice that there are a lot of fake s300 components in the market and they figured out they basically advised how to identify fake s300 from the authentic one that basically showed that the the fan is much smaller in the fake version there are few other visual differences the problem with clones is that sometimes you can identify them by by looking at visual characteristics or sometimes you can actually look at the electrical properties and figure out if it is a clone or not but but in some cases the clones are extremely difficult to detect because what they can do they can reverse engineer the design and it's easy to reverse engineer even a complex chip today using the imaging and, and reverse engineering instruments we have to our access and then they can create a copy which is exactly the same in terms of electrical properties and in terms of in terms of optical characteristics so that makes it even more difficult to detect clones and that's why there is a need for increasing research in this area another problem as i as i alluded to is called hardware trojan problem or basically malicious hardware which can go inside the chip or inside the pcb and these hard these malicious components can be inserted either in the foundry or in the untrusted design house and when they're inserted they can actually do significantly bad things for example if if an attacker puts an antenna on the chip this antenna can be actually sending sensitive data like your encryption key to an attacker remotely and that can be a significant confidentiality problem and the attacker can also try to incorporate hardware which can cause malfunction for example it can work as a time bomb the attacker can put a counter which can count up to certain value and at that time it can start malfunctioning so there are some interesting um, impacts of such malwares which can go inside hardware for example there was a military helicopter which which crashed and when they investigated they did not find anything in the software or in the network or there is no manual error and they attribute that to hardware malware which is hardware trojan so these are the problems we have that's not all of it but just to just to give you glimpses of the problems that can happen at the hardware level and all IoT devices are actually vulnerable to these problems so what can you do to protect against against this so these, these problems so what i'll do for the next uh, uh, 20 minutes or so i'll talk about the solutions which we are looking at and the other researchers are looking at in these domains and the first one I'll, st I'll start with is the hardware trojan problem because to me that's one of the very intriguing problem and very complex problem to deal with and michael hedden who is the former cia director uh, he basically called this problem as a problem from hell why is that because he said if you have a billion transistor design then and there are only few transistors which are used to either cause a confidentiality problem or integrity problem in the hardware how do you detect that post manufacturing because post manufacturing you do not have direct access to the internal of the chip so he called he called it a very very difficult problem to deal with and what happened is that in 2010 u.s military bought 56,000 chips to go into their missiles and rockets and weapons before those chips were actually deployed 
they found a huge problem in the chip. They, they found that the chips actually come with a back door. Those chips were fake chips. And not only they were low quality fakes, they had hidden back doors or Trojans inside that. So this is a huge problem and this is a practical incident that can, that can actually lead to significant issues in, in critical applications. So how do they look like? A Trojan would be a circuit inserted into a hardware that is expected to be rarely triggered and when it's triggered is expected to either leak information or cause malfunction. And I'm not going into details about that, but the reason it's very difficult to detect a Trojan is that unlike functional verification where you are trying to detect if it is functionally correct or not, for example, if it's if I'm doing A plus B, all I have to do, I have to check if it is doing A plus B correctly for all possible input vectors, right? I do not detect anything outside that bound. So functional correctness verification is, is governed by the bound given to me by the functional specification. But unfortunately for trust verification, I have to look beyond. I have to see if it is doing anything more than that right now that space is infinite so that's why the verification of trust is is a fundamentally different problem and it's a much bigger much more complex verification challenge than traditional correctness verification so what do you what do you do to deal with the problem so in our research lab we are looking at several solutions the first solution we looked at is actually a statistical testing solution you cannot look at specific trojans that can go into a design because that space is infinite right so you cannot enumerate each of them and detect each of them separately so what can you do what can what you can do is that you can come up with a statistical means and this is just one solution which you called mero or multiple excitants of rare occurrences. In this case, what we are trying to do, we are looking for the rare nodes or events inside the circuit and we are trying to trigger them, each of them, multiple times. With the hope that if you trigger them multiple times, then any trigger condition made out of that can also be triggered and you can observe the effect of a Trojan. Now, if you do simple probability analysis, you will see that this works very well for small Trojans. If it's a Trojan which is triggered by few few nodes, let's say two or four nodes, then it does work very well. But if it's a, if, if it is a Trojan which is triggered by many internal event conditions, then you need to do something else. And to do to to detect those Trojans, we are we are looking into something called side channel analysis, where we are basically looking at the power or the current. And the idea here is that if there is a malware inside the chip the power signature has to change from the authentic one. But the problem is that the power signature signatures anyway change from chip to chip due to intrinsic manufacturing variations. So you have to somehow isolate the variations due to process, process variations uh, from the effect of Trojan and that can be done by looking at multiple parameters at the same time. And if there is only process variation, you can expect a correlation and if there is a Trojan, there will be an outlier it will be basically violating that correlation and you can detect that in the you can detect a tampered chip or a chip with trojan by looking at the behavior of the chip in multi-parameter space but of course you need set up golden chips to compare with to create a reference but many of the cases you do not have golden chips for example these days many of the chips are purchased online so if i'm building a system by 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 uh, having chips from Amazon or DJ Key, we do not have golden chips. How do you verify the trustworthiness for those chips which you are buying from Amazon, for example? So to do that, we are coming up with a solution which which does not need golden chips. We call it self-referencing. A chip can actually refer itself. And the idea is that a typical chip would have a lot of components which are similar, like this Intel multi-core processor, and you can create response for one region of the chip with another similar region and there is a difference then there is a Trojan. You can do the same thing in time because most of the chips are actually doing the same things again and again like the processor is doing phase decode execute again and again. If there is a Trojan like a counter then the current signature for one window would be different from the other and you can compare these two and figure out if there is a Trojan. So this doesn't require any golden chip. This is a very, very interesting problem to solve because 
to me, this is probably the most difficult problem in security because you do not have actually any reference to compare with. You are actually either exploiting the feature of a Trojan or exploiting the feature of a golden design to figure out if there is any, anything wrong there. Now, another interesting attack which can happen particularly for IoT is called physical tampering. And this is called mod chip attack. If you just go to mod-chip.com in your internet browser, you will see that for most of the gaming devices and set-top boxes, there are instructions on how to take, how to open the set-top box and then physically modify the printed circuit board so that you can bypass all the DRM protections built into the system. So it will tell you, and there is a corresponding YouTube video on how to connect one node to another node so that if it's, let's say, a set-top box for a cable company, you can view all the channels. If it is a gaming console for, let's say, Microsoft Xbox, you can actually play a Sony game there. And this is becoming a huge problem for these companies because now attackers can phys physically modify the hardware to do whatever they want. So how do you detect the, the physical integrity of a hardware? There is a need for a solution in that area and one can actually try to do remote monitoring of the physical health. For example, if there is a Cisco router and somebody is physically modifying the printed circuit board, Cisco would like to know, right? So how do you do remote monitoring or remote authentication? That's a huge problem and we are coming up with a solution for that. And one interesting solution we have developed is, is the one that exploits the existing DFT infrastructure called JTAG infrastructures in PCB where the chips are connected and you can actually um, you can actually look at the the signature the delay signature for for the chips and across the chips then combine them into one signature for the chip or the fingerprint for the uh, for the PCB and if there's any attack that fingerprint would change so you can remotely query the device and figure out if there is any change in the hardware and that's an important attack modality for IoT devices. And then I talked about the patching requirement, right? The hardware has to be adaptive. And the reason it has to be adaptive is that the hardware is dealing with a lot of security assets in it. Today's system on chips, which are going into all IoT devices, will have a lot of assets to deal with. They range from the encryption key, communication protocols, communication configurations, defeature bits, then um, the other things would be firmware and the user sensitive data. So these assets have to be protected and to protect those assets, security engineers in companies like Intel or Apple or Qualcomm have to implement something called security policy. These policies govern the confidentiality, integrity and availability for those assets. And there are a number of policies, like maybe 50 to 100 policies like that. So how do, you, how do you implement those policies? Today it's very ad hoc. These policies are implemented after the architecture is defined and the integration is done. Security engineers will basically come and look at these text documents and figure out what policies have to be implemented. And these are the example policies. These policies would guide inter-IP communications, would guide the access to those assets. But the problem is that what if few years down the line when the, the chip is deployed in the field there is a security problem like the recent ones which was revealed um, through the, the, the spectre and, and meltdown bugs what happens um, what, what can you do to deal with the problem in the hardware so we came up with a solution and this is a project founded by SRC or Semiconductor Research Corporation in this project we are coming up with a security brain it's an in infrastructure IP that can be integrated with the system on chip IP blocks to, to control the security of all the assets in the system on chip and thereby it can basically make sure that not only you can systemic, systematically control them but also you can configure them post fabrication and this is the hardware patching idea which he proposed in the IEEE Spectrum article. There is more to that if you want to know more you can look into that. The final solution which is another big idea which are which are, which are looking at is called hardware virtualization. All of you have been dealing with hypervisor and operating system level virtualization that basically gives you a, a way to secure one application from another application by creating an isolation or boundary, isolation or boundary across these apps. Can you do the same thing at the hardware level? The answer is yes. And if you do, there's a huge security benefit. And we are looking at field programmable gate arrays. These are being used in IoT devices a lot these days. And this gives you a reconfigurable framework. But unfortunately, 
most applications are directly mapped to the FPGA that causes a programmability problem or productivity problem. Another problem is the, is the size of the bitstream. It's typically few megabyte. It's not good for remote uh, update for the bitstreams. It also takes a huge amount of time to compile your design to the FPGA. So what we are doing, we are coming up with a virtualization idea for FPGA, which means on the FPGA, create a virtual fabric. We call it overlay and then map your design on top of the overlay. If you do that, there are significant benefits. The first one is that it actually improves your productivity by order of magnitude. The bitstream size is reduced by three order of magnitude and the compilation time is improved by two orders of magnitude. So it's a huge benefit in terms of those, not only that it has significant security benefit because it gives you isolations across different applications, it also helps you to deal with side channel vulnerability. I'll not go into details, but this is a powerful paradigm for securing a PGA based IoT systems. To conclude, you know, the problems are real, multidimensional, and it requires innovative solutions for researchers. Um, there are definitely a lot of interesting, intriguing problems to deal with. The, to me, the most important solution would be, which will be effective across all layers of IoT, would be the one which combines design solutions with validation, with runtime adaptation, and that actually would be the holy grail for IoT security. With that, I will stop, but I have to acknowledge my collaborators, uh, Professor Mark Tehranipur, Professor Yeer Jean from University of Florida, Dr. Sandeep Ray from NXP Semiconductor, Dr. Sambhajit Mandal from Case Western, and my students, also the sponsors who have sponsored multiple research activities in the lab. Thank you. I believe we've got uh, about 10 minutes for questions. Is that right? So uh, if anybody has a question, please raise your hand. Plenty of time for some interactivity. Uh, I guess I'll start with one. Maybe I can break the ice. <laughs> the, uh, as we move into an IoT space where we're moving from maybe a half dozen or so devices in the home to potentially thousands, the whole issue of, of managing the uh, certificates, the public key certificates in these devices, uh, putting them in in the first place, who validates them in terms of the root trust, what remediation and canes we have to revoke them. Do you, do you have uh, some ideas to how to deal with that issue? Does that represent a problem that's different than today? And do one of your solutions perhaps address that? Yeah, that's, that's a very, very powerful question. <laughs> so um, when it comes to IoT security, and I briefly alluded that, these devices are being used by naive users. And I, I basically refer to my daughter and my grandma. They do not know anything about security. So if you have a smart home with, with let's say, tens of uh, devices like smart light bulb, talking to the smart thermostats, and then smart carbon monoxide detectors. So all of these talk to each other, and they, they should have security updates, and should be all seamless, right? So there is a need and it's still an unsolved problem. There is a need for what I call autonomous security. Because security requirements would change. You cannot speculate what the security requirements would be 10 years down the line. So that means if there are new attacks or if there is new security requirements for your deployed device, these systems should be able to upgrade itself autonomously with, without my knowledge. Okay? So, there is a requirement for that. They should talk to each other and upgrade themselves. Uh, this, is, this is an interesting and important problem. And there's no solution out there. But uh, as a researcher, if, if, if you would like to take that challenge, then definitely it will be a good, good research problem to deal with. Another question here? So uh, the question that I have is that, for example, if you see the example of the Cisco router and all those things, right? Suppose as a user, I want to go into market and want to purchase a camera, and the original is, say, example, $100. But then I'm getting like the counterfeit one. I don't know if it's a counterfeit for $300, and it has. So I'm just saying that even for this IoT things, for example, the user perspective, how you, how for example, as the researcher, we can convince people to buy the original things rather than counterfeit because people may buy the less cheaper things, which may have, say, example. 0.5x less performance, but that should be okay for the normal user. So, so um, that's a good point, and that reminds me 
um, about an experience I had 25 years ago. I was a student at that time and then I was trying to build my own, own computer. So I went to a market in Kolkata, that's a northeastern city in, in India. And then this particular guy had Intel Pentium processor. So I had to buy a Pentium processor. So he outright asked me, so there are two types of Intel processors. One is, one is fake, another is genuine. The fake one is actually twice as cheap, and, but, but twice as slow also. Which one you like? So sometimes they will, they will upfront tell you that there is a fake version of that. Now as an user, you have to make your decision. Are you worried about the security? For example, these IP cameras, if you buy a fake IP camera, of course genuine ones might also have vulnerability, but the fake ones would be more likely to have vulnerability. Now are you willing to compromise security for lower cost? If you, if you want to do that, then there's nobody to prevent you from doing that, right? So it's your conscious decision, but the fact is that the security has to be brought into the, the pricing um, of the device. So if, if it is an expensive device, but it gives you higher security versus it's basically a less expensive, doesn't give you um, that security, then it's, again, it's up, up to the user to decide at the end of the day what they want to do, right? Thanks. Question here. So I want to ask a little bit on the virtualization that you're talking about there. I know in IT type environments, they'll do virtualization, maybe even containers to try to run isolated uh, you know, applications. Um, if you do that on a compromised hardware device, how does the virtualization protect you and what's the additional overhead and power usage you would have? It would, you would have? So, so that's a very interesting question. You know, virtualization on a compromised device, um, we, have not, we have not done that because it's a new topic and we, we believe it's, it's very, very powerful in terms of giving you a lot of security benefits. Just to, just to add to what kind of security benefits it can provide, um, one thing I did not mention is that right now there is uh, growing interest in multi-tenant computing in a PC. The idea is that companies like Amazon is providing you a PC as a service, which means you can offload your application to Amazon Cloud and they will run into run that application to an APG that gives you higher performance. So if, if they do APG as service, then what happens is that your application would be running in the same APG as my application, and my application being a rogue application can try to compromise your application or steal data from your application. So virtualization can actually help in that area also. I did not talk about that. But if the APG itself is compromised, the APG has vulnerability or, or let's say malware into it, then um, you need to detect that. And virtualization um, may give you a security layer to somehow bypass that, but not 100% not uh, confidence in terms of bypassing the security or trust issues that might have in the hardware level. So we are looking at um, malware that can happen in a PC. There, there are many different types of malware that can happen to a PC. If you talk to Xilinx, they'll say, there is no malware on the hardware because we trust TSMC. That's what they say. But, but the fact of the matter is that there is vulnerability. There might be malware on the device itself, not on the mapped IP, but on the device itself. And if there is any malware like that, the only option for you, or the best option for you, would be to detect that before that APC is actually deployed in the system. And there are techniques which are coming up to detect those malwares in the APC. The advantage here is that APC being so regular Detecting malware in a PC is, is, is much easier than detecting that in a processor or some other chips. Uh, we have time for just one more question. Uh, I'm curious about the, the idea that vendors could insert some form of remote uh, diagnosis into their devices. Uh, I wanted to ask if there's consideration for the fact that that might be just another potential security loophole, and if so, what are the put, uh, possible ways in which we can counteract that and try to make it more secure? That's a very, very good question, yeah. So um, we recently got a, a Semiconductor Research Corporation grant to deal with that problem. If we have hardware, if I'm Cisco, I would like to monitor the integrity of my hardware. I do not want my router to be compromised. If I'm a cable provider, I want to make sure that my set-top box is not compromised. So monitoring the hardware health remotely is a necessity and, and nobody is looking at that. 
except for my research group that's unfortunate but i believe somebody some other people would be would be considering that problem as a valid problem now what can you do um, you can definitely create a signature from the hardware but you are absolutely right that that's that is vulnerable to various types of attacks itself for example when the hardware is creating the fingerprint for its health right there i can try to inject problems or, or i can try to manipulate the hardware so that that signature is not correct and then when it's communicating the signature to the base station there will be another problem and the final problem is that not due to an attack but the signature changes over time because of the intrinsic physical changes in the device so we are coming up with protocols so that the attack on the signature or the sign communication path can be can be prevented one way to solve the problem is that you definitely encrypt the signature when you transmit to let's say cisco or other other base station and the second solution which has to be done on the hardware itself is that when you are creating this fingerprint you need to make sure that fingerprint cannot be compromised so the attacker cannot physically tamper your hardware to compromise the fingerprint itself so yes there are a lot of interesting research problems right there but we believe there is a need for constant remote monitoring of the hardware Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Uh, so I would like to present uh, Professor Sharub Bhunia. First, let's have a big round of applause for him. <laughs> I'd like to present a token of appreciation to Professor Sharub Bhunia.